Today I'm making caldo verde, which is a Portuguese recipe. I think it's got to be one of the most simple, straightforward things that I make. So it's brilliant if you don't want to uh, go to a lot of effort, but you want something that's really tasty. It's just got six ingredients. It could even be five because the way I do it, I do it with onion and garlic. And I think purists might say that you just need one of those. You don't need both, but I quite like both. <laughs> so it's got onion, garlic, potato. Um, kale or cabbage, I'm using cabbage, a spicy sausage, I'm using chorizo, and stock. So that's just six things. Um, so I'm going to get started on that now. So yeah, here are my ingredients. Got garlic, chorizo, onion, I'm using it. I've got a large shallot, I'm just going to use that. Potato, um, cabbage, and here's my stock. I'm using homemade stock because I have this leftover from cooking some chicken. Um, and it was frozen, which is why I've just heated it up in this pan here so that it's ready to use. So I'm now going to chop the vegetables and the meat and get it started. It's very simple. All I'm doing here, first I'll fry the chorizo to get some of the oil out, um, remove the casing of the chorizo, fry it in little chunks to get some of the oil out, put it aside, and then everything else just kind of boils up together um, in one pot. And then I add the chorizo back in towards the end. So that's what I'm going to be doing. So I've chopped my onion, garlic and potato. I'm gonna lightly kind of soften in oil for a couple of minutes, the garlic and onion, then throw in the potatoes. Cook them for a minute or two. The recipe says to peel them, but to be honest, I don't really see the point. I quite like the skin of the potato. So uh, after those have kind of fried in the oil with these just for a couple of minutes, I then pour in the stock, get that simmering, and then kind of start shredding my cabbage and also frying the chorizo chunks ready to go in later. So I've got my onion, garlic and potato simmering in the stock over here. It's not quite come to a simmer yet, but it will be for about 20 minutes. I've peeled the casing off the chorizo, cubed it, and I'm about to kind of fry it in a dry pan. Um, it's a really fun ingredient to cook with because you get this gorgeous red oil coming out of it. Um, the color I think comes from paprika. Um, but you do need to kind of leave some of the oil out when you add the chorizo into the stew, so that's why we do it in a separate pan. And I think like most meat, um, Chorizo is very, like if you get a bad one, it's not especially nice. There's a big supermarket in the UK that I think sells the chorizo that is just horrible, so I don't buy it there anymore. So if at all possible, kind of try and get a good quality one. You can leave everything in this recipe kind of chunky. It's a kind of rural, um, you know, simple food of kind of scraps and leftovers. So there's no need for it to be kind of super fancy looking. My recipe says two large handfuls of uh, kale or cabbage. I usually do quite a lot because it's just one of those things that shrinks down into nothing when it cooks. So. I may even put a little more than this in because I don't really have a plan for what I'm going to do with the rest of the cabbage other than have it with my kind of lunchtime salads that I have. Look at the incredible colour here, it's absolutely delicious. But yeah, you can see why you need to um, extract some of the oil before you put it into the stew. So I'm just going to get this in the soup now using a slotted spoon um, so that the oil stays behind. There's no real time frame of when you need to add this, um, or even the cabbage really. I mean, the cabbage will cook through in a few minutes. Um, there's seven minutes left on the cooking time, so I'm gonna chuck cabbage and chorizo in now. So yeah, there's nothing left to do with this now, apart from that it cooked down for another sort of seven or eight minutes. Um, the cabbage will kind of wilt down, the potato will cook through and it will be ready to go. I'll just add a little salt and pepper and then that'll be done.
Every time I make this Caldo Verde recipe, I'm always kind of surprised at just how tasty it is. I think just because of how simple the ingredients and the processes are, it's just so flavorful. Um, I'm sure a lot of the flavor comes from the chorizo because that's a really flavorful ingredient. But um, every time I make it, I'm always kind of surprised at how good it is. Uh, recently, I've been making a lot of uh, pasta fagioli, which is an Italian bean and pasta recipe which is a similar kind of stewy type dish. Um, and the processes are so much more involved. Um, I really love the dish and I'll do it on the vlog at some point. But with that one, you kind of make a sofrito, you cook down all these vegetables to begin with very slowly. And then you slowly, you add the beans and you slowly cook those and the whole thing kind of takes a long time. So um, whenever I think of that and compare it to Caldo Verde, I'm always amazed at how much flavour um, this dish ends up with, even though it's very simple and quick. So it's definitely one of my top recommends. And because it was so quick to make, um, this episode was going to be very short. So I've added a baking segment at the end of some sort of dark German style rye bread that I made for the first time recently. Um, I really enjoyed this bread. I was I had no idea what it was going to be like um, and it turned out to be really delicious. I make a lot of sourdough bread um, which has a really really chewy crusty kind of texture which I love but what was really nice and surprising about the rye bread was how soft the texture was. It was almost sort of melt in your mouth soft um, and because it has um, a lot of kind of dark sugar in it it was a little sweet but not in a bad way. Um, really, really delicious and not so sweet that you couldn't have it with sort of savoury things. So I'm definitely going to be making that again when I can get my hands on rye flour again. I've run out at the moment. So that's what I'm going to show you next. Today I'm making a dark German rye bread. I thought it would be an interesting change since the bread I usually make is almost always nearly all white flour. This is usually made with molasses, which... Um, can be hard to get in the UK. I have muscovado sugar, which is close. It's not really the same. Um, I could use dark treacle, but I don't have any of that. So I'm going to use the muscovado. I think I'm supposed to use it a little less because um, probably molasses is a little less sweet and a little more kind of flavorful. So I'm going to use a little less of the muscovado. Um, but other than that, the ingredients will all be the same. So first up, I'm going to dissolve my yeast with the sugar and warm water in a bowl. Here are the ingredients that are going into my bread. Here's the rye flour, some strong white bread flour, cocoa powder, salt, oil, water, um, muscovado and yeast. Now that that's all dissolved, I'm gonna start making the dough in a big bowl. I think I'm going to whisk the mix just slightly before adding the flour to make sure it's really combined because it's looking kind of uh, a bit separated at the moment. When I add the bread flour I'm going to add almost all of it but reserve a little so that I can judge uh, the consistency of the dough before I turn it out and start kneading. Now I'm going to knead it for five to seven minutes until it really starts to come together. It's quite a tough dough to knead, but it's looking good. It's quite elastic. Um, I'm just oiling my bowl. I'm going to put it in this bowl. I uh, put it in my proofing bag and leave it for an hour to an hour and a half, as long as it needs to double in size.
Here's my cool looking bread dough. I'm just about to turn this out onto the counter, shape a loaf on this uh, pizza peel that I've sprinkled with semolina so it doesn't stick, because I'm gonna be um, baking this on a pizza stone. Um, so I'm gonna push some of the air out, knead it a tiny bit, shape the loaf on here, and then it's gonna prove for another half an hour, 45 minutes. says to kind of knead it a tiny bit. I don't, it's gonna be fairly dense, so I don't wanna knock too much air out of it, I don't think. So I'm just gonna kind of shape a loaf here, I think, like a sort of oval loaf maybe. pretty cute. Let's get it on here. So that's going to prove for half an hour to 45 minutes. They say you don't want it to double again, you want it to sort of double in half size again. So they recommend doing half the time you did for the first proof, which for me was an hour and a half. So I'm going to do 45 minutes. Here's my loaf. I'm going to score the top a couple of times with my blade. And also when I put it onto the pizza stone in the oven, I'm going to mist a little bit with water. And that's going to bake for 40 to 50 minutes. So here's my loaf just come out of the oven and it's cooling down. I don't know what it's going to be like. Um, I will have to get back to you when it's cooled and I slice it open. The bread is actually really lovely and soft inside. Um, yeah, it's quite a nice flavour as well. But I was most surprised at the softness of the texture.